So welcome everyone to our wet planned pond side talk for this month. We're glad to have you here on this rainy morning. So a few housekeeping rules before we start. Just remember you've entered in mute mode with your cameras off. Please keep your cameras off and, and stay on mute while we're doing the presentation, especially on a day like today where it's raining and some thunder and lightning, which can really interfere with our IT. Um, please use the chat feature. And if you haven't done so already at one of our wet plan talks, put in your email and your zip code. Um, that information will not be shared with anyone. We just use it to uh, keep track of attendance and to invite you to future events. So you can also use the chat feature to ask questions if you have one. And if you have a question and you'd like to speak with us, just remember to unmute yourself so that we can hear you and please be brief. Um, and again, be aware that we are recording this session. So wet plan watershed education and training ponds, lakes, and neighborhoods is brought to you by a partnership of organizations. And on the um, line today, we have with us Marlene Rodak from the Cocolobo chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. We have Maria Romero from Lee County Division of Natural Resources. We have uh, Ernesto Lasso de la Vega from Pond Watch with Hyacinth Control District, and Andy Tilton with Johnson Engineering, and myself, Karen Miller with GHT. We're also engineers. So our featured partner today is Marissa Figueroa with Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve in, in FDEP. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Marissa now to do more of an introduction. Thanks, Marissa. Thank you, Karen. And thank you to the wet plan team as well. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of an overview of Rookery Bay, we are a National Estuarine Research Reserve, which is one of the 29 NERS across the nation. The benefit of having a National Estuarine Research Reserve in your backyard is to serve as a place-based resource that benefits our community through research, education, coastal training, and resource management. Rookery Bay manages 110,000 coastal acres in sunny Naples, Florida, and accounts for approximately 40% of Collier County's coastline, which as you can imagine, is a lot of land to manage. Um, that being said, we are also downstream of all of those water bodies in our, in our entire region. So it's imperative to continue to educate folks on best management practices and to provide information that we can help protect the coastline for all to enjoy. One last housekeeping reminder, um, this partnership allows us to offer continuing education credits. Um, these credits today are going to be for FNGLA and for FDACs. Um, if you don't know what those are, that's totally fine. Um, but if you do, then we, I want you to know that there is one caveat um, to that and a quiz is required. So make sure you pay close attention today um, because the certification agencies will require you folks uh, to take a quiz and score 70% or higher in order to receive your credits. So at the end of today's webinar, I'm going to provide a link and that link is going to take you to your quiz. Um, it's going to be a Google form and it's gonna have approximately 15 questions relating to today's presentation. So make sure to answer all of those questions completely and click submit at the end, because that's going to be how I receive your request. Um, so make sure that you're paying attention and if you have any questions, be sure to ask. Our, today, our presenter is going to be Ms. Tabitha Cole. Um, she will provide us some information on littoral shelf plantings and their legal considerations. So what to expect is going to be the first part of the presentation will explain the importance of pond plants to Florida's named wildlife and waterways with an emphasis on stormwater retention ponds found throughout many communities in Florida. And the second part will describe the requirements of littoral shelf planting areas, which are also known as LSPAs and man-made ponds. So I know we have our bio up for today, but um, Ms. Cole did study environmental science at the University of South Florida. Since then, she worked on marine restoration projects, performed environmental laboratory work, and has been involved in environmental focused conferences. For the last three years, Ms. Cole's worked on Collier County, or worked for Collier County as a senior environmental specialist in the position where she reviews residential, industrial, and commercial development projects for compliance with environmental code and policy. All right, Ms. Cole, over to you. The floor is yours. 
All right, thank you, Marissa. Uh, can you hear me all right? Okay, good. So I'm gonna share my screen here so I can put up my presentation. Okay. All right, perfect. So I know Marissa already gave my introduction, but my name is Tabitha Cole. I'm a senior environmental specialist with Collier County's Development Review Division. And part of my position there with the county is to make sure that proposed retention ponds in our local communities meet county environmental code. So with that being said, my presentation today will be about the benefits and our county requirements for littoral shelf planting areas within retention ponds. <clears throat> Throughout Southwest Florida, our communities use man-made retention ponds to manage stormwater. Retention ponds or stormwater ponds um, are dug to accept nutrient and pollutant filled waters that drain from our paved roadways and our yards. When these ponds receive this runoff filled with these pollutants, they help to prevent deterioration of downstream rivers and other natural water bodies in our area um, that they may have otherwise gone into. The theory is that these ponds slow down the flow of water and filter these contaminants naturally by allowing debris and silt to sink to the bottom of these basins. So this diagram here, uh, it shows the different types of runoff uh, that stormwater ponds assist in filtering out. We have the residential runoff and the urban runoff um, with things such as oil and gas, antifreeze, fertilizer, pesticides, industrial waste, cleaning products, paint, and solvents. <clears throat> uh, different pollutants contaminate stormwater runoff depending on the type of development. So um, the nutrients, they, they can contain, sorry. <laughs> As shown here, we have the residential and the urban. The, they can contain oil, gas, pesticides, heavy metals, fertilizers, bacteria, and nutrients as it flows over the roadways, our parking lots, yards, and other landscaped areas. Uh, these pollutants could cause degradation to water quality and serious harm to Florida ecosystems if they flow directly into water bodies without any kind of filtration or decomposition. So retention ponds are a necessary part of Florida's developed landscape, as well as our stormwater management system. But since these ponds are man-made, they often look unnaturally bare, being devoid of natural wildlife and vegetation. So as a result, they're susceptible to algae blooms caused by naturally occurring algae that feeds on excess nutrients from the surrounding runoff. Um, which then brings us to our main topic, which is littorals. A littoral zone refers to the coast of an ocean or sea or to the banks of a river, lake, or estuary, really any water body. The littoral zones have access to sunlight through their entire water column to the floor of the water body, and this makes them optimal locations for aquatic vegetation to really flourish. The littoral shelf planting area is the sloped edge of a pond that is planted with aquatic vegetation within that littoral zone. So by placing plantings in these littoral areas of a retention pond, they can really improve the aesthetics of the pond. The man-made pond goes from having this bare, muddy perimeter to a beautiful, soft planted kind of transition that can be filled with colorful flowers, such as the pickerel weed shown here in this photo to the right. Um, and in other instances, you could have shade bearing trees like a red maple or a pond cypress or dahoon holly. Um, littoral shelf plantings can really add a natural beauty to an unnatural but necessary pond in our communities. So as well as the aesthetic benefit, they also help in preventing erosion. They provide protection and control of eroding shorelines from runoff, which is in turn reduces the likelihood of accidents from dangerous, unstable eroding shorelines, like you can see in these pictures here. Um, it also helps maintain property values for the properties that are found abutting these ponds.
By planting proper vegetation in a retention pond, you can also help improve water quality. Plants help in removing excess nutrients and pollution from the water that come from runoff. Shoreline plants produce great quantities of oxygen as a byproduct of their growth through the process of photosynthesis. This in turn benefits the health of the overall lake. Um, with a healthy lake comes a healthy habitat for aquatic life and other species of wildlife. Florida has lots of aquatic birds. Um, Aquatic birds can be a really good indicator of the health of an ecosystem that they occupy. So littoral plantings do not only improve the water quality, but they can also provide important foraging and uh, nesting areas for certain bird species. And then also provide shelter and protective cover from predators and the elements. And these benefits are not only for birds, for the birds. Uh, plant stems and leaves can also provide protective nursery areas for young fish and uh, food and habitat for aquatic insects. The photosynthesis from the shoreline plants puts off available oxygen as well for fish and other wildlife to utilize. So these plants, you know, they improve the aesthetics, uh, they prevent erosion, they increase water quality, uh, but they and they also provide habitat for a native fish and wildlife to thrive. Okay, so this brings us to <clears throat> the second part of my presentation, which is going to be about the requirements that we have in Collier County for our littoral shelf plantings. Um, throughout Southwest Florida, there's similar requirements in all counties. Um, they slightly change county to county. So our county requirements, they've evolved over time with the intent to increase the benefits that littoral shelf plantings have for our retention ponds. These requirements include things like area or acreage of the littoral shelf plantings, um, location of them within the lake, location of them within the link bank, uh, shelf configuration, plant selection, and then protective signage. All these requirements have to be shown on a site development plan before we actually approve the development in our area. The requirements for the littoral shelf planting areas are different county to county. Uh, some counties require a linear mini minimum, whereas other require a minimum area size. Our code has changed throughout time, but we currently require that 7% of the lake area from the control elevation be calculated to determine what is required for our planting area. This is for most parts of our county, but we have um, certain areas that are designated as highest habitat value. We call these the Royal Fringe Mixed Use Overlay Areas. Um, in these areas, we require that they be 30% of the lake. This is intended to lessen the adverse impacts from development in these more sensitive areas of our county. The location of a littoral shelf planting area in a lake is important to ensure that plants can provide the most benefit. Uh, for instance, if a preserve or an open space is adjacent to a lake, this is gonna be the ideal location to put those plantings as opposed to say in someone's backyard along a residential lot. Um, a lot of times littoral shelf plantings can be thought to be weeds. So if you have them in someone's backyard, there's the potential that they may want to get rid of them. This, by putting them in these areas that are more ideal like the preserves or the open space areas um, helps reduce any impact from regular lawn maintenance such as mowing or the herbicides. Or if the lake has control structures, like say a discharge pipe, there's a minimum requirement that we have for 20 feet between the pipe and where the plants are going to be put. Um, this is to prevent any impediments to the flow of water from these discharge pipes from getting clogged up by the plants. We do want them somewhat near the discharge pipes though to help filter out what's coming into the lake, just not too close. <laughs> Many times communities will have multiple stormwater lakes that are linked or connected. 
If this is the case, then the required plantings for each lake, they don't have to be in their designated lake. They can be consolidated in a lake or multiple lakes um, that have the highest potential or suit suitability um, for those plantings, as long as they meet our thousand square foot requirements. So you can't have an area that's smaller than a thousand square feet. Um, it doesn't have as much benefit if they're smaller like that. The design elevation of a littoral shelf planting area, it's determined determined is based on its ability to function as a marsh community and the ability of the selected plants to tolerate the expected range of water level fluctuations in that pond. So generally um, a marsh community in our area has a hydro period between six and 10 months. Wet seasonal water levels range from 12 to 24 inches above ground elevation and then the dry seasonal water levels around six inches below ground elevation. And that's in an average year. Uh, but each, each lake is different, however, and the design of the shelf can deviate from those values if a site-specific data is given for that specific lake. The bank of a proposed area to be planted has to have an eight to one slope or flatter. In a lot of older lakes in our county, you'll see a four to one slope, it's a little steeper, um, but these only allowed for thin strips of vegetation to be planted and really limited the planting design. So that's why current code is now an eight to one or flatter. It allows for more design and bigger areas. An undulating bottom allowing for shallow pooling during the dry season is also encouraged and shelves can also be terraced, um, kind of as shown in these pictures. <coughs> Um, and with the terrace, they can, they don't have to meet that eight to one elevation in any one given spot, but as long as the overall area has that eight to one or flatter, then it will meet our requirements. To encourage diversity and therefore providing a healthier habitat, we require that at least three species of plants be planted in the littoral shelf planting areas, and not one species can be more than 50% of it. Um, and out of these three species, at least one of them has to be a herbaceous species. So again, this is, it's to help maintain biodiversity in the lake, which then in turn, you know, increases the health of the habitat and what kind of wildlife can use it. So our county's pollution control department has created a list of recommended plants to assist property owners or developers when choosing their plant selection. They also, with this list, have different um, design guidelines and give you instructions on different ways that you can make your littoral planting areas. So I have a couple links on this page here, um, which we can provide in the chat. The first one is to this suggested planting list and also the de design guidelines. And the second link down here is for the pro prohibited aquatic plants per the Florida Administrative Code. Uh, so with both of these, we have recommendations on what to plant and then recommendations on what not to plant. We also have plant specification requirements to ensure plants become established, survive, and have room to grow and for natural recruitment. Uh, for spacing, we have 20 feet for trees, 5 feet for shrubs, and 36 inches on center for the herbaceous smaller plants. Then there's minimum planting sizes, uh, which is three gallon containers and four foot high for the trees, one gallon for the shrubs, and 12 inches high for those herbaceous plants. Some variations to these rules can be made for clustering of plants. If clustering of plant, the clustering of plants uh, can be allowed to provide for scattered open areas, as long as the open area does not constitute more than 20% of the required shelf area. And the elevations of those open areas have to be at least a foot deeper than the surrounding planted areas. So there are some deviations allowed, but they're kind of limited. So littoral plants are frequently misunderstood and thought to be weeds or overgrown vegetation obstructing the view of the water. 
So for this reason, we make sure that there's protective signage placed around these littoral shelf planting areas so we can protect them and no one gets rid of them. Um, in our county, we require that the boundary of the littoral shelf planting areas be posted to identify and protect the plants from being mowed or sprayed with herbicide. This is with the exception of, of the control of exotic and nuisance vegetation, though. Those you can have herbicide on if we don't want them there. <laughs> the signs must be spaced no further than 150 feet apart, with a minimum of two signs per littoral shelf planting area to ensure full coverage of the area. The signs also have a maximum height requirement of four feet and then a minimum size requirement of two square feet. In order for a site development plan to be approved in our county, the site plan does have to show, one, the calculation table showing the required area and the percentages being met, two, the control elevation and the dry season water table, three, the maximum water depth in feet, as well as the estimated number of months of flooding per the planted elevation areas, four, a plant list including the appropriate range of elevations for each specified plant species, um, spacing requirements, and plant size. And lastly, five, um, all planting locations. <clears throat> oh, you know what? I did want to go back and this, this list here also has additional information um, in this like comment section where they can give you some beneficial information on different species types. For example, um, let's see, we have the, where is it, the swamp lily. It recommends if you mix it with other herbaceous vegetation due to its spreading slowly. So there's just other great information in there to, to reference when you're designing your littoral shelf planting areas. All right, so the, in addition to the requirements that we have for those site development plans, we also require that some standard notes be provided just to guarantee the health and longevity of these littoral plants. So the first uh, group of comments that we like to have given to us um, are in regards to plant health, density, and survival. 80% of vegetation coverage in the littoral shelf planting areas are required to be maintained within a two-year period following that initial planting activity. And they have to be maintained at that 80% or higher in perpetuity. Any natural recruitment of plants over this time can also be counted towards that natural or towards that coverage requirement. It doesn't have to be just the plants that were planted. There is, however, exclusion for natural recruitment of any nuisance species or cattails. We do have a requirement that cattails have to be removed either manually or with a US EPA approved herbicide when they begin to exceed 10% coverage. They spread really fast, so we try to maintain those. Um, and then the last note that all littoral shelf planting areas have to be kept free of refuse and debris. So then our second group of notes that we require on our plans are in regards to exotic and nuisance vegetation. All prohibited exotics and nuisance species are required to be removed as they occur either manually or with a US EPA approved herbicide. The prohibited exotics are listed in section 30508 of our Collier County Land Development Code. And then the nuisance plants are listed as the class one and the class two prohibited exotic, or sorry, prohibited aquatic plants specified in the Florida Administrative Code. Yeah, and that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I hope I provided you with some great useful information or some new information. Uh, thank you so much for your time. So, do we have any questions? If you have a question and we'll hear from you. Karen, this is Andy. One of the things I wanted to say is that in working in several different counties and municipalities, Tabitha was right that each one of them have a little bit different uh, guidelines and uh, things, but this is a very good rounded list of plants for creating 
not only literal shelves and, and areas, but also in doing perimeter plantings to decrease the erosion and, and those type of things. Um, and, and the use of at least three plant types uh, help, <clears throat> helps in a number of ways. And one of those also is that um, the plants, some plants do better in certain soils and certain types of water. And so by putting three or more types of plants in, you allow the plants to figure out wh which ones like to be there and which ones don't and allow kind of natural selection uh, for each of the pond areas. And that may actually change by pond or portions of ponds, depending on the soils that were there or are there after the construction of the pond. So I had a question. You know, I'm just wondering, it seems like um, some of the challenge is getting, you know, it's it's not getting the design correct and, and the right plants there. It's getting the maintenance afterwards right. And does the county have a, a policy of inspecting ponds or is it is it pretty much everyone's just left up to, you know, an honor system to keep them maintained properly in, in the right amount of plants? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of both. So it takes a long time for a development to grow or to be built out. So once they're completely built out, that's when they do their final inspections. And this can take years sometimes. So by the time that they're at their final inspections, it's usually been a couple of years and they go around and check all of the tour shelves to make sure that they're at that 80% requirement and that they're not filled with um, nuisance vegetation or cattails or exotic vegetation. Um, but once we do that final inspection, that is generally the last time we go out there. But there is also code enforcement that gets involved if anyone calls in a complaint that their littorals aren't looking too great. Um, and at that point, we would also go out there and we'd require them to do replanting if necessary. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? I have I a got... question. I'll go ahead. Ernesto, go ahead. No, no, I was going to leave the person who was going to say, uh, and I'll ask later. Okay, who else was there? <laughs> okay, I'll ask my question then. Ernesto here. I'm sorry, cutting somebody else with a question, but I'll, I'll let me go through mine first. Um, so the, the I saw the, the requirement was one to eight. Uh, that's a very long, long slope uh, for filling up with plants. I, I remember when it was one to four and it went later, the county, Lee County is doing one to six and now it goes to one to eight. That's a lot. Um, and I wonder how, who decided on the one to eight and what was the, the reasons for that decision? And I'll... Mm -hmm. I believe, I, I can't speak to Lee County because I'm not sure what their requirements are, but for Collier County, I believe it was back in 2001 that we changed that slope requirement from a four to one to an eight to one. And the reasoning from my understanding was that it was limiting um, design design of the littoral shelf planting areas and giving us thin strips of vegetation. And we wanted something a little wider so that it could really help with the water quality and improving habitat for wildlife. So that was the intent behind increasing that slope is just so that we can increase the width of those littoral shelf planting areas from my understanding. If I may comment on that, um, I understand mm -hmm. it and I 100% agree with that intention. But the reality is that a lot of those shallow lands are going to be covered with a lot of filamentous algae. And that's the on a, on accepted by most homeowners to have filamentous algae. That is the on site, the sites that they don't want to complete continuing um, experiencing. And unless you fill it with uh, one monotypic type, like Iliocris, the uh, spike rush, and which could be, but then it will be in huge quantities and it will be affecting the other um, limitation that you have in your ordinance, where you have to have a composition of diversity and you will have monotypic uh, Iliocris to fill all that land that is gonna be in the one to eight. 
Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of give and take sometimes when they're revising code. There's, you know, it may benefit one thing and then, you know, but it doesn't touch on everything. Um, the code's always changing, requirements are always changing, but but I, I understand where you're coming from. Unfortunately, I, I was not the one that wrote the code, so I don't know the complete intent behind it. It was back in 2001, but that's just my understanding. So we just had an anonymous question asking if there's penalties to the communities that aren't compliant. There, there can be penalties or they're required to um, come back up to code to meet what their site development had been approved for. I don't know if there's any financial penalties behind that. That would be between code enforcement and the community, um, but it is the HOA's responsibility to keep their properties in compliance with our code and in compliance with their approved site development plans. Okay. If older communities have riprap or other types of shorelines that can't be planted, are they grandfathered in or do they have to change due to the codes? Um, lakes that have been established prior to requirements of littoral shelf plantings or prior to the change in that slope requirement, um, they, they get grandfathered in. They don't have to come up to current code unless they're making modifications to their lakes. If they end up expanding their lakes or changing the shorelines, at that point we would ask that they meet current code. But if they're not changing their lakes, then, then they get grandfathered in. And Tabitha, what about restoration projects? If a if a community has lakes that are out of compliance and they pay maybe a shoreline restoration company, do they have to come up to the current codes? You lost you, Marlene. Oh, I'm sorry. Oops. Um, no, Marlene I could hear you. The mute dance. I can hear you, Marlene. Okay, I'm sorry. Did you hear that question? Could you, could you repeat it? Okay, um, my question is if a community is out of compliance um, and they wanna do a shoreline restoration project, do they have to meet the current code for littoral mm -hmm. zones? Um, if they're changing their lake to a point where they would need to come in and create a new site development plan of record, then they would need to meet current code, but if, if it's an old lake that was approved and they didn't need littorals and they're just choosing to put the littorals in there, they wouldn't necessarily have to meet our current code if they're not revising um, the, the current approved plans that they have on record for their community. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, yeah, sort of. It's a little confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no, if they're not changing the lakes on their site development plan and they're not changing their their plans of record, then they don't need to come into new compliance as long as they're in compliance with what was originally approved. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is there is there a size of stormwater pond that that's applicable? Like, are, if you're putting in a really small stormwater pond, say with a parking lot or something, is that still subject to all these uh, regulations or does it matter? It is, yeah. There, I don't believe there's a section of our code that exempts any lake sizes. So it's all, all retention ponds um, have that required littoral shelf planting area. People can decide to do a dry detention instead for their water stormwater management. And at that point, since there's no standing water year round, we wouldn't require the littoral shelf plantings. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I was when talking... is the best time to plant? That's a great question. Um, I, I'm actually not sure about that answer. <laughs> I usually do the, the code compliance with the plans. Um, I don't really do the operational actually installing them. So I, I'm not really sure. This is Andy Tilton. From my experience in doing projects, uh, it's ideal to plant late in the springtime when the water levels are relatively low and offers the, the easiest time for the workers to actually put the plants in 
and minimizes the amount of time that they have to be cared for before water levels come back up in the ponds uh, in, in the wet season. Uh, they can be put in almost any time, uh, but like a lot of other plantings, if you put them in in the springtime, then you get most of your growing is going to happen during the summer, and that's right after you've put them in. If you plant them in the fall or the winter, then there's a lot more maintenance that has to be done that first year to kind of get them through that slower or no grow season, get them into the next growing season. So that's just a, a function of, of what plants like to do as far as when they like to grow and when they don't. Can I add something to this discussion too? Yes, sir. This is Kamala with uh, Collier County Pollution Control. And I, I agree with what a Andy just recommended, but I generally prefer that people do the plantings early in spring um, with supplemental irrigation to give the plants a little bit of help before uh, rainy season comes in. I've, ha I've worked with a lot of com communities that have actually lost plants when they install them too late in spring, like right at that you know, um, initial May uh, rainy season start. Um, and a lot of plants can end up popping up out of the ground because they're usually installed as bare root. So if you get, you know, a couple of heavy rains right there at the beginning of uh, summer, you can end up losing the plants. So I tried to get people to just do temporary irrigation um, at the early part of spring before you get into that heavy rainy season because you never know what's going to happen down here. That's just my two cents. Where, where can I find from Collier County online, our uh, original plans from the developer regarding the lakes and the littorals. So they may not be online if it's an older community, but you could always contact our records department um, and request uh, the original plans that were approved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I would like to add uh, another place where you can find maybe this information is uh, the ERP, which is the Environmental Resource Permitting. And that is a document that can be found, uh, is hard to find in the Water Management District website. And I have, um, it's, it's like really finding a, a needle in the haystack. I mean, it's really, really hard, but most environmentalists and a lot of engineers, they know where to go and find that for your particularly. If you send an email uh, to us at the wet plan uh, website requesting that, I sure I will send you my little sheet notes about how to get to that particularly website, of the water management district and get the ERP, which it shows a blueprint of the development when they first, if they have that, if they have it, they made a PDF and you can find that blueprint where they're supposed to have all the planting and all the areas where you're supposed to be. And that will be a great asset to have for the community. Thank you. So, and for those of you who didn't see the chat, Camilla did say that Callier County Pollution Control does offer pond inspections and littoral plant suggestions is a non-compliance and enforcement process. So, so if you need some help, give Camilla and the folks at the county a call. Do we have other questions out there? We have time for maybe one more. Can I say one thing? Uh, um, I appreciate this program, it's terrific. I've worked with Camila and other people at the county, Marissa, uh, at Rookery. So thank you for this. This is excellent. Well, thank you for that. And, and I agree, Tabitha, you did a great job. We really appreciate you taking the time to present to us. It, it's, it's information that's really helpful. And I know my firm has a couple of projects going on in Collier County. So I'm going to be passing this video on to others so they can watch it. Great. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that I could help. Thank you for having me. Any closing remarks before we move on, Tabitha? No, just uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs>
All right, wonderful. I think I'm going to share my screen again so that before we close it out, I can show you just a few things. Um, all right, can folks see my screen now? Yes. Great. So we have in Lee County, we have kind of an exciting thing going on. We have our pond competition. We've talked about it in the past. But if you go to our website, uh, www.wetplan.org, uh, you'll just need to scroll down a bit on the page and you'll see the announcement about our pond contest. So this is a contest that takes two forms. One is for um, you know, the best pond. So if you have a really wonderful looking pond and you've been working hard at, at um, keeping it beautiful, Please enter the contest because we want to uh, we want to give you some kudos for for doing a good job on your pond. On the other hand, if you're in the midst of trying to redo your pond and you know it needs work, um, we're also helping to have help with a what we're calling a mini makeover. So if you go to the website, scroll down, find this announcement, click on the um, announcement, and it'll take you to the contest rules. So you can read a little bit more about um, all the rules and, and prizes and uh, all that legalese stuff. Um, once you accept that and move to the next, you'll just need to answer a few questions about your pond and give your contact information and some other details. So we're really excited to offer this program. We're hoping people are gonna take advantage of it. Um, and if you have any questions about it, feel free to email uh, Maria or anyone else on the wet plan team and we can answer your questions. So with that, I'm going to pull up the continuing education credit sheet again and I'm going to um, turn this over to Marissa so she can talk to you more about that. All right, folks, I'm really hoping that you guys enjoyed today's program. Um, hopefully you guys were able to have uh, plenty of your questions answered because I am about to post the link um, for your quiz today in the chat. Uh, just a quick reminder that when you go to request your CEUs, you will have to add your name and your email address. Make sure your name is spelled as it is on your certificate so I can make sure to get that to you promptly. Um, in addition, uh, the email address is what I will be using to get your CEUs to you. So please make sure that you review those and that they're spelled correctly. I, I hope uh, everyone's able to get their credits for attending today. All right. Um, so with that being said, I'll go ahead and pop that into the chat. And if anyone has any more questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, and thank you for, for helping us with that. Being able to offer continuing education is a great benefit, and we really appreciate your partnership and help with that. So um, again, this program was brought to you by Wet Plan, Watershed Education and Training, Ponds, Lakes, and Neighborhoods. So um, feel free to visit our website for more information. There's a lot more videos on there. All of our past programs are on there, so any any of our past uh, wet plan webs, wet pond side talks, um, you'll find there. And there's our email address, wetplaninfo at gmail.com. So if you have any questions, feel free to email us and ask. And with that, I will thank you all for joining us. And again, thanks to Tabitha and Marissa. Um, we really appreciate your efforts today. And hope you all have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Great job. Thank you. Bye.